what's up. This time around, we're gonna start building that engine for my friend Joris's P1800, a car that he drove all the way up to the north of Sweden from his home in Holland. Um, I hope you're gonna enjoy it. It's gonna be quite technical, but I'll do my best to explain what I am about to do. So here goes. And I already showed you in the last episode all the components we're gonna use, so let's start building. Just thought I'd say a few words about bearings. When building Volvo engines, I like to use German Kolbenschmidt or uh, Volvo original spare parts. I know there are cheaper versions out there, but to me, that doesn't really make sense at all. If you want to save a buck building a new engine, save it on something on the outside, like paint, for instance, something that really doesn't matter that much. Because at the end of the day, if you put cheap Chinese bearings in your engine, chances are it's going to break down soon and you're going to have to tear it apart again. And what fun is that? So. My advice, use quality stuff. When assembling an engine, it is important to make sure that you lube everything up properly. Uh, as for the bearings, sure, you can use your standard motor oil. I like to take it a step further and use stuff like this, the Torco engine assembly lube for high pressure points or this version from Clevite. Um, this will make sure that your engine has uh, lubrication at like high pressure points at first startup, like the camshaft and even the bearings. And this is especially true if you build an engine that's just gonna sit for a while before you start it up. This is very sticky. So even if you leave your engine sitting for like a year or so, you can be sure of that there will be sufficient uh, lubricant on the bearings once you start it up. So also very good advice, use proper stuff when, when uh, putting your engine together. Putting your bearings in, you want to be extremely careful. You want to make sure that everything is perfectly clean. This engine block has been properly washed and prepared at an engine shop. I couldn't do this good of a job at home. So I'm very, very confident about this, but I've also taken uh, you know, extreme care to make sure that everything is gone. Like there cannot be any dust or any grit or anything here. If you put your bearing in, you start at that end with a groove and just click it in. If there's any sound, like a, if you can hear some something moving dirt or so, take it out, clean it again, because you haven't done a good enough job. It has to be 100% clean. Lubing up before installation, I actually use my fingers and I clean my hands like never before, before I do this. And I think, at least to me, with my fingers, I can feel if there are any, any, uh, scratches in the bearings so if there's any dust here I would feel it right away so I think it's a good way to make sure that everything gets done right as for the lube you don't want to put too much or too little in here you don't want it seeping out on uh, the edges because it should only be exactly where you need it Next up, the crank itself. This, to me, is a thing of beauty. It's uh, a late model B20 crank, eight bolt version, made by Swedish steel producers, Bofors. You see the B there? They even make, uh, or they actually also make a lot of guns and cannons and stuff. And if you go to the Bofors Museum in Karlskoga, they actually have one of these cranks on display at the entrance. Quality is just unmatched, phenomenal. At one time, I left five or six of these at a machine shop. They all came out of high mileage engines and five out of six were still within factory specs after 40, 50 years of heavy use. So just great cranks. Installing the crank is gonna be one of your heavier duties when building an engine. And it's also a very tricky one. You don't wanna scratch any of the bearings. You don't wanna lower it down evenly and slowly and carefully and just make it seat perfectly in the bearings, like so. And once you have the crankshaft in, you wanna twist it ever so carefully, just to make sure that it's fully seated and in the right position. And there we go, ready for assembly. You know the old saying, power is nothing without control? I think the same goes for building an engine. 
you have to be very careful and meticulous at every step, especially with the internals. Because like I said before, you don't want to mess this up or else you're going to have to tear the engine apart again. Anyhow, I have now installed the caps um, and just finger tightened the bolts. Having done that, I want to turn the crank over just to make sure that it rotates super smooth and easy with nothing catching. And of course it doesn't because I've been thorough here. Well, that was a bit, you know, bragging, but it's more, I trust the Volvo engines and I, I trust my workshop. I know they've done it right. Anyway, um, I keep doing this. Now I'm gonna tighten them down to factory specs and having tightened each and every one of them down, I will do the same thing over, just slowly rotate, rotate the crankshaft over to make sure that it feels just right. Crankshaft is in. Okie dokie, let's move on to the pistons. This is what your standard piston ring kit will look like. It is super easy and very easy to follow. Uh, starting at the bottom, this is the first ring you install. This is the oil ring, the oil scraper that keeps the uh, oil from the crank case down where it should be. Then you have the intermediate pist uh, compression ring and the top compression ring. Oftentimes the rings have an upside and a downside. You can see this has, uh, here we go. It's a little bit different on one side compared to the other. In that case, nine times out of 10, you'll have a mark or like, like right here, it says top. So you know which end goes up. So you start with a bottom ring, you go to the second ring and then the top ring. Cause if you would start with this, you would have to pry this one over the first ring and that wouldn't make any sense at all. When installing piston rings, sure you can use your fingers and nails, but that is a bit of a hassle and you might end up snapping them in half or you know, we get bloody fingertips. So I use one of these. This is a very clever device that helps you expand the piston rings over the piston in a safe fashion, which I will now demonstrate. So I will now demonstrate how to use this tool. What you wanna do is you wanna put this uh, piston ring firmly seated at the base here. Uh, these two little edges catch onto the opening of the piston ring and then you pry it open like so, gently and slide it over the piston to the groove where you wanna put it and gently let go. And that's it, job done. Okay, so we got the piston rings on, then it's just a matter of sliding it in, right? Well, not quite. You wanna keep track of where your piston ring openings are. Uh, this would not be a good idea. Both uh, compression rings have the opening at the same place. That means uh, compression would seep through here. Also, you have the wrist pin. Uh, this is the, uh, the front of the piston pointing forwards in the engine. Then you have the wrist pin center line here. What you want to do is put one of the compression rings on this side, op the opening on one side, and the other opening on the opposite side. And the oil ring should be kind of pointing at an angle backwards like this on either side when you have a, a piston like this with three different rings on it. So I will do that and then use my trusty old piston ring compression tool to uh, compress the rings before knocking the piston and the conrod into the engine. Okay, so next step, I'm gonna install the uh, connection rod bearings or the conrod bearings. These conrods have also been thoroughly checked. Uh, make sure that the holes are perfectly round, etc. And we have the right uh, play on the wrist pin. Uh, these are perfect. They're put down to, again, factory specifications. Same procedure. I clean, even though these parts have been professionally cleaned at a shop, I also use brake cleaner to uh, go over them one last time. If you look carefully, you might have seen that I actually had these old bearings in before. And this is because we used the, the one, one piston and rod in the engine block with the crankshaft to determine the, uh, the height to make sure we get the right deck height when we uh, machine the engine block. Okay, so the last thing I do before actually sliding the piston in is I apply a little bit of brake cleaner and clean the cylinder out one last time just to make sure there's nothing there. And you often get this, like a slight, slight discoloration not really dirt, it's not really gonna do anything, but you know, it feels better to, to be very, very careful and very uh, meticulous. Oh, I also got to tell you one final thing. I always apply just a little bit of WD-40 to make sure the piston slides in nice and easy. There we go. Okay, so now it's finally time to put the piston in. 
Um, you also want to make sure that you have the crank turned so that the uh, uh, journal is at the bottom of its cycle. That way you can slide the piston in with the piston rings, then turn the engine over and pull it up so that it actually meets the, uh, the journal on the crank. Okay, as you can see, I have now put the piston in here. I've made sure I have the front mark pointing exactly where I want it, like so, and made sure that the piston ring compressor is firmly seated against the engine block. And then take a rubber mallet, give it a couple of gentle taps, and it should slide right in, like so. And no further than this, because like I just showed you, uh, you don't want open con rod hitting on the crank so the crank is turned the other way around now i turn the engine around and pull the piston up towards the crank i have now torqued these two bolts to factory specifications i do the same test again just to make sure that everything moves the way it should even though you don't want to turn your engine over that often or that much without actually starting it but with the assembly grease you have this advantage too you can turn it over without being at risk of damaging the bearings Next on up, I'm going to install the number four uh, piston uh, because this journal is also at the same position, which means I don't have to turn the engine over a full lap without for doing that. So also, you know, just a minor detail, but it might actually do a bit of difference. All right, so that's uh, pistons number one and two installed. So now I'm just going to turn the crank over and continue with two and three. But before that, let's have a cup of coffee and talk philosophy. You know, before moving on, I thought I'd talk a little bit about building an engine such as this. It might look a bit complicated, but it really isn't. I mean, no offense, but for my part, I have no formal education as to the technology or, or engineering. Um, I studied political science at university for crying out loud. What I did do was I started working on car engines when I was 13 or 14. My parents knew nothing about it. Um, they still don't. So, well, put it this way. I didn't study the Battle of Hastings in school. I was reading car magazines. So I picked up a lot from there. But that said, everything I do here, you can do at home with the tools you probably already have. What you would need is like a piston ring compressor, a uh, torque wrench and a few other bits and pieces and an engine stand that helps and a good clean surface to work on. Um, an engine such as, this, such as this, the Volvo B20, is super sturdy from the get-go. So even if you do mess it up a bit, you're still going to end up with an engine that works. So my advice, just do it. And good luck. And hopefully you will be as successful as William the Conqueror was at Hastings where he won and then moved on to be a very successful international rally driver. Or maybe, maybe I just made that up. Either way, let's move on. All right, so it's camshaft time. And like I said before, this beauty here is made using an old shell cast Volvo camshaft from the 1970s, a B20A profile. Um, excellent quality of steel, so I know these work, they work real well, and I bought a few from the same company before, one of which I've used in, I think, three different engines now, it's still, like, in brand new condition. Um, this point right here, the top of the camshaft lobe, is where the highest pressure in the entire engine. So if you have any failure in terms of the uh, lubrication system, or if the wrong kind of oil, or if the camshaft it's not good enough, and if you don't break it in properly, you end up with something called pitting. And that looks like this. This is a lifter from another B20. Um, not entirely sure what happened, whether if it's the, the lifter, the poor quality, or if they had the wrong kind of oil, or a you know, breakdown in the oil pump or whatever. But this is what happens. You lose material at the base of the lifter, and then you're, well, you're screwed, basically. So I'm gonna put this together using the uh, Torco engine assembly lube and lubricate it quite a lot on the on the lobes just to make sure I have enough for the initial startup. All right, so that's the camshaft all lubed up. Next up, sticking it into the block. Now, sticking the camshaft in can be a bit of a hassle. Uh, some guys use it like a hand screw on handle at the end of it. Um, I don't have that for the Volvo camshaft, so I just go very, very gently. Once you reach bearing like that, you can rest for a second or two. The tricky part comes towards the end, where you want to hit the last bearing 
in the block. And come on, there we go, it's in. And that's all there is to it. Next up, we're gonna secure the cam in the block using this. As you see, there are two different versions, one metal, one copper. And some people argue which one of these are the best, especially when we're talking about tuned engines. For me, I really can't say there's been any difference whatsoever. What I do know is if they look like this, if they have like a real groove cut into them, the camshaft has been moving a bit too much. And if I was to install this with a brand new cam, the cam would move around too much. What you can do is just flip it over and mount it with this side, with this side facing the uh, the engine block, and it would be like brand new again. But in this case, I'm gonna use this one because that one is pretty much brand new. There we go. Now, there are factory washers that kind of fold around the edges here. I've found them in some engines, but not that very often. So instead I use a locking washer and Loctite, and I've never had any problems with this. Never even heard of anybody who had these little bolts come loose. So I'm guessing that it's not that big of a problem, you know, or it's not that very common. Installing the cam gear is a very straightforward affair. As you can see right here, there is a little mark on the crankshaft and a matching uh, mark here on the camshaft gear. All you need to do is line everything up and then gently slide the camshaft gear in like so and tighten it up. The camshaft bolt tightens to 90 newton meters, which is quite a lot. And for that reason, I have temporarily installed the flywheel plus a little locking device. So here goes. And that's it. There we go. Now, I have heard of people who have managed to snap the front of the camshaft off, uh, tightening to 90 Nm when they've had a camshaft that has not been a original Volvo cam, but an aftermarket cam with softer material. So be wary and make sure you know what kind of camshaft you have before you tighten the bolt. Yeah, look at this. I'm finally getting around to getting the engine out of my uh, my rally car, my V18 uh, that blew up last winter. Uh, but that's a different story. Um, as for Joris's engine, that was it for this episode. Next time around, I'm gonna start working on the cylinder head, on the carbs, and uh, everything else that follows. So, um, yeah, that's something to look forward to. I hope. And I got a bit of a spoiler alert. That engine will be dyno in Holland once Joris has uh, driven it back down south to this home country and um, yeah as always like comment and please subscribe i really really like all the feedback i get and i will answer everything whether it's in english or swedish um dutch not so much i don't understand a word of it but maybe joyce can help out if you're from holland and want to comment um yeah that's it take care i'm gonna get busy with this